For a little more on this, we're going to be joined by my Golf Week colleague, Beth Ann Nichols, alongside Golf Channel reporter, Amy Rogers. And Amy, I'd like to start with you. I'm curious what you think this does for Nelly Corda's confidence, because it's not your run-of-the-mill win. She's coming off a poor season. She's going up against somebody who won last week, an all-time great. And she does it with an eagle birdie to make the playoff and then triumphs in the playoff. This has got to be an enormous boost for Nelly Corda. Well, if we didn't know already, we certainly learned it on Sunday. Do not count out Nelly Corda. This is not the first time that she's created some drama for herself down the closing stretch. Remember back in 2021 at the Annika event, she came into that final stretch with the lead as well. Made triple bogey on the 71st hole, but rallied with a birdie on the 72nd to force a four-person playoff that she went on to win. Well, we saw that same sort of, of resilience from Corda here yesterday as well as she rallied from that bogey, double bogey, bogey stretch with an eagle birdie to force that playoff from Lydia Ko. And as Nelly said afterwards uh, in her post-round press conference, you know, I think she learned a lot of valuable lessons and to learn them so early in the season will be a springboard for her hopefully going forward to make these next few victories a lot more drama free at least on her end but for the rest of us it was great it was must see tv beth ann i'm thinking of hank aaron's home run chase trying to chase down babe ruth or tiger woods's no cut streak or his four straight major championships is there a world where lydia ko's pursuit of the lpj hall of fame becomes a storyline that we follow throughout the next couple of weeks or months and that it's good for the LPGA. I, I definitely think so. As much as I wanted to see Lydia, you know, win yesterday, I, there was a big part of me. It was like, wait, I'm, I'm not ready for this. I'm not ready to say goodbye because I think, you know, we don't know exactly what Lydia is going to do. Lydia probably doesn't know what she's going to do, but I, I think most of us would be hard pressed to think she'll be playing much longer after she gets into the LPGA hall of fame. So for the LPGA, this is a great thing to be able to stretch it out you know, get some media attention, hopefully some folks who normally don't spend the resources to get out and cover the LPGA that they will when they know that there's this exciting storyline to follow with Lydia Ko because she's just so gosh darn likable. <laughs> Amy, is that an opportunity for the, the LPGA tour that Beth Ann has just touched on when there's so much uncertainty and lack of clarity around the men's game and sponsors wondering if they really want to sustain the kind of purse increases that are out there now. Is that an opportunity for the LPGA Tour to say, look, this is what we've got and it's pretty darn good? Absolutely. It's funny you should mention that because Beth Ann and I were sitting in the media center at the season opener having this exact discussion. Um, we had just heard about the Wells Fargo sponsorship obviously going by the wayside uh, after this 2024 season. And now we're seeing the Farmers Insurance Open, that title sponsorship also going away in 2026 uh, as well. And I think there's a, a possibility here for some of these companies, if they want to stay in the golf space, to make a transition potentially to the LPGA. I mean, we've seen the title sponsorships on the PGA Tour side increase 13 to $15 million. I mean, that's more than all of the total purses um, on the LPGA tour. So I think there's an opportunity here for these companies to remain invested, to stay in the golf space, and maybe a little bit of a smaller investment. Beth Ann, what do you think? The star power that we saw really the last couple of weeks on the LPGA, is it a different vibe, a different feel, a selling point for this tour? Well, it, it was certainly much needed because, as we all know, you know, neither Lydia nor nor Nelly Porto won last year on the LPGA. And you throw in that mix of Alexi Thompson, and and it, it's the tour's desperate for it. And I really think the LPGA was smart because last week during the drive on early in the week, they had a meeting training, media training for their players. And, you know, these players need to know that they can't tell their story enough. That That's the message that they heard that any time they have an opportunity to tout the LPGA, to talk about their road to, to where they are, that they, they should do it because not enough people know the world number one Lilia Vu story. And it's a remarkable one. And I just think that, you know, the LPGA needs its stars to say yes to these more than they say no. Beth Ann, you know that we never really just get to talk inside the rope stuff anymore. There's been a long rumbling attempt at a merger between the LPGA Tour and the Ladies European Tour. It was supposed to be voted on. The vote hasn't happened and neither are reports that Gulf Saudi has stymied it since the Saudi Arabian oil company Aramco finances 25% of the purses on the LET. What can you tell us about the latest state of those discussions? 
Yeah, so the LPGA commissioner sent a letter to to the players earlier this month uh, that shed a little bit of light on on why there was such an abrupt reversal. I mean, these players walked into the the seasoning event in Spain and expected to vote, and then were told at the very last minute, never mind. And essentially, at the very last minute, uh, Golf Saudi re requested more information. Was the was the official line that they wanted to know more about the ins and outs of how this would in, impact them, this potential merger. But but we all know this wasn't a last minute thing. As you said, this has been this was postponed at the end of 2022. I mean, these two tours have been working on this merger and the details of it for a really long time. And essentially, Golf Saudi said, look, you know, you know, our, our before we finalize our events for the 2024 schedule, we need to take a pause on this vote. And so the, the pause is an indefinite one. There's the players have no idea. I don't even think the tour has any idea when they might vote again. It might it, perhaps it might come at the end of this year. But the reality is, you know, this is the first major power move that we've seen Golf Saudi make in the women's space in terms of calling something off in a big way and and essentially, uh, you know, threatening to to not hold their events. Uh, and so, you know, the letter went on to say, you can see that our relationship, you know, is still in a good place as evidenced by the schedule. All those events are on the 2024 schedule for the LET. So a, a lot of question marks. Beth Ann, tennis is having a, a similar discussion. You have Chris Everett and Martina Navratilova saying don't engage with the Saudis because of women's rights issues, whereas Billie Jean King is saying you have to engage to, to open minds and to, to have change happen. Do you think that the conversations are similar inside the locker room of the LPGA, more amenable to those discussions, or are there more concerns about women's rights? Uh, you you know I don't hear as many conversations about women's rights as you as you would think. It's it's more about money and opportunity and what does this mean for long term sponsors for the tour. Uh, it's less less of an ethical conversation I think for many players and and more of a, a practical one. And uh, and I think you know there's some concern that if we do put all of our eggs in the in the Saudi basket, what does that mean going forward? You know if 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 the Saudis come in and have a lot of control on the LPGA, you know, what are other title sponsors going to think about that? How many might drop out, you know, from an appearance sake, even though they might actually do business in Saudi Arabia, but what does it look like to have that partnership with a women's organization? You know, so, you know, it's it's really murky. And, and at the end of the day, it's no different than the men's game in many ways and that it all comes down to money. What is different, though, is that, I don't know that these tours could survive should they go full in with the Saudis and then the Saudis change their mind in five years, three years, what's left? And even if they don't change their mind, I guess there's still a reputational question as well. Amy, on, on this idea of the schedule, we've just had a couple of hot weeks on the LPGA tour schedule here with Lydia winning, obviously Nelly in that playoff yesterday. Now they're taking a few weeks off, then it's a three week swing in Asia that some of the top American players tend to stay away from for the travel reasons. So it's two months almost, last week of March, before we get back in the United States. We had this conversation last year. Is that is it an issue and is it fixable? Because I know they do have a huge market in Asia as well, but does it halt the product momentum in any way in your mind? I think the LPGA knows that it's an issue. We've heard Molly Marcus Simon say in early days that trying to create a schedule that was more conducive uh, for their athletes was something that was a priority. And I think they've tried to do that again this season with adding that second uh, stop in Florida after the season opener. Uh, but to your point, they knew sooner get going with these two amazing weeks. They really couldn't have gotten off to a better start. And now we're seeing a halt in momentum as now we're going to wait another four weeks before uh, the LPGA gets going again. And once it does, unfortunately, they're going to be playing in the middle of the night with the time difference. And so a lot of times the action sort of gets lost in the shuffle for fans as well. That's also coming off the heels of a very short off season. They've added that Grant Thornton Invitational in la late December. And I spoke to Lily Avu and a number of other players who were uh, remarking at just how short that time off was. I mean, Lily Avu saying, um, you know, she just feel like she didn't have a lot of time to regroup coming into the season opener. She said she felt very stressed. And I think that we, we've seen that now in her results. I mean, through the first two events of the year, the top-ranked player has been really a non-factor, hasn't been able to break uh, 70 through the first two events of the year. So I think having that extra time, finding that right sort of uh, balance and cadence with having time off 
and then getting the schedule going uh, on a more regular um, basis rather than the stop and start would be something that everyone would be welcome to figuring out. Well, it has been an incredible start to the LPGA season. That much we know. Amy Rogers, Beth Ann Nichols, thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Thank you.